today on Family Talk. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Family Talk, which is a division of the James Dobson Family Institute. And I'm James Dobson, and we're glad to have you today. Uh, you know, Christians in the 21st century are increasingly bombarded by immorality from every direction. I'm sure you have noticed that because you can't miss it today. It is important for believers to understand the origins of these secular worldviews in order to understand them better. And we have a program today that's dedicated to that subject. In a moment, you're going to hear a conversation between my colleague, Dr. Tim Clinton, executive director of the Dobson Family Institute, and with him was author and speaker Nancy Piercy. She helps to explain the significance of abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism and uh, relates it to what she describes as a low view of the body. First time I heard that, I wasn't sure what that was. In essence, it's the evolutionary theory that implies that our physical, emotional, and mental selves are without any real significance. And our bodies can be engaged in all sorts of immoral behavior without spiritual consequences. In truth, there are biblical passages and guidelines that we must pay attention to because they came from the God of the universe and he doesn't make mistakes. Uh, with that, let's hear from Dr. Tim Clinton and Nancy Piercy as they discuss this very important topic. Joining me today on this edition of Family Talk is Nancy Piercy. She works as a professor of apologetics and director of the Center for Christian Worldview and a scholar in residence at Houston Baptist University. Nancy's a two-time Evangelical Christian Publishers Association ECPA winning author. She also founded Breakpoint Radio and serves as the executive editor. Nancy studied Christian worldview under uh, someone I had a chance to learn a little bit from, and that's Francis Schaeffer. Uh, he, of course, was the great theologian and philosopher who had a tremendous impact on Christianity. The Economist has recognized Nancy as, I love this, America's preeminent evangelical Protestant female intellectual. You're going to uh, witness uh, some of that today as she talks with us. She's here to discuss her new book. It's called Love Thy Body, Answering Hard Questions About Life and Sexuality. Nancy, welcome into Family Talk. Tim, thanks for having me, and greetings to Dr. Dobson as well. Hey, Nancy, as we get started, it's insanity out there. You get up on social media, up on the airwaves and more. Uh, there are very intense issues that people are debating, uh, and I think there's a real divide in our culture. Are you seeing that? Oh, absolutely. And I think for parents, it's very troubling because there are kids on social media all the time. And so their kids are picking up secular worldviews in a degree that we just did not see in previous generations. I recently spoke at a Christian high school, and all of the questions that I got from the young people, from these high school students, were oppositional. They were all parroting what they're hearing on social media. So it really struck me how much our young people today need to be equipped to answer the secular arguments, especially on these issues of sexuality, homosexuality, transgenderism, as well as the life issues like abortion and euthanasia. So those are the issues I deal with in my book, and I try to equip parents so that they can talk with their children when their children are coming home and asking them questions that they're picking up from social media and from their secular friends. Nancy, you're right. The influence coming at them is unbelievable through this phone. And it's around issues of human life and sexuality and more. And the church doesn't have a lot of influence in their everyday life anymore. And so the challenge we have before us as parents, as educators and more, is we've got to know what we believe. We've got to know uh, a reason for the hope that lies deep within us. And I, I really am so encouraged by uh, your, your new book, Love Thy Body. Body. Um, Nancy, you do say this, that human life and sexuality are watershed moral issues of our day. Why do you hold to that? Yeah, in my book, Love They Body, what I'm trying to do is give parents the tools to go beyond a negative message. That's what Christians are known for, right? They're known for saying, don't do it, against. it's wrong, yes. it's a sin. 
young people are not going to respond to a purely negative message. In fact, none of us really does. It's very hard to live out the Christian life if it's just a matter of don't do it. Uh, we have to have positive principles to follow as well. And so in Love Thy Body, I equip parents with positive arguments they can make with their young people in order to show that the Christian ethic is actually based on a very high view of the human person, a very positive view of what it means to be human. I give parents the tools to help their young people get excited about Christianity and, and want to live it out. You know, it's one thing to be convinced that it's true. It's another thing to want it to be true because it's so beautiful and it's so life-affirming. You say at the heart of all this, Nancy, is the issue of worldview. Um, can you explain that? Because that's where the great divide begins, isn't it? Yeah, why don't I just jump into an example? The issue that is really at the forefront today is transgenderism. And so many of our young people feel like they have to affirm the secular view of transgenderism in order to be inclusive and loving and affirming. But what I show in Love Thy Body is that transgenderism actually rests on a very negative worldview, a negative view of the human body. After all, transgender activists explicitly argue that gender has nothing to do with your body. It has nothing to do with biological sex. A BBC documentary says at the heart of the debate is the idea that your mind can be at war with your body. Hmm. At war. In essence, they are acknowledging that it's an inner conflict. And of course, in that war, it's the mind that wins. The body is not seen to be a part of the authentic self. I recently read an interview with a 14-year-old girl who had lived as a trans boy for three years, from age 11, and then had detransitioned and reclaimed her identity as a girl. And she said, the turning point came when I realized it's not conversion therapy to learn to love your body. This uh, interview came out after my book had already gone to print, but I thought what a great quote it would have been for a book titled, Love Thy Body. The Christian ethic is actually based on loving our body and having a high view of the body as God's handiwork. When God created the world, he said it is very good, and that includes the material world, it includes nature, it includes the human body. Why accept such an extreme devaluation of the body? And so the way we can arm our children to face the secular world is to help them to have a much higher view of the value and dignity of the human body as made in God's image. Because, Nancy, when they begin to try to think through these issues or take a biblical position on these challenging social issues of our day, um, they start getting labeled uh, as a bigot or they're intolerant or we're discriminating against people. And there's a lot of shame that starts coming their way, even retaliation. And so this kind of political correct orthodoxy, you call it, uh, is a challenge for all of us and a challenge for parents. And this is where this gets beyond confusing because we're trying to teach principles based on a Christian worldview, but figuring out how to intelligently and maybe compassionately communicate that message, Nancy, is where this thing really gets difficult. Exactly. Um, When I was at that Christian school recently with uh, high school students, I have to tell you that the majority of the questions had to do with homosexuality. What most people don't realize is, again, the secular view of homosexuality rests on a very low view of the body. Let me unpack that for a moment. No one really denies that on the level of biology, physiology, anatomy, chromosomes, males and females are counterparts to one another. That's how the human sexual and reproductive system is designed. So to embrace a same-sex identity is to implicitly contradict that design. It's to say, why should my body inform my identity? Why should my biological sex as male or female have any say in my moral choices? We have to help people see that that's a profoundly disrespectful view of the body. And the Christian answer is, why should we accept such a low view of the body? I argue in Love Thy Body, in my book, I argue for a Christian ethic that's holistic, that our mind and emotions are meant to be in tune with our body. 
I give a lot of stories. Don't think of this as a book on just moral argumentation. I have lots of stories. Oh, I love the and stories. One of my, they were, they're, they're amazing. And one of my favorite ones is um, a young woman named Jean, who lived as a lesbian for many years, became a Christian. Today she's married and has two children. So what changed? She says, I came to trust that God had made me female for a reason, and I wanted to live in accord with the Creator's design. So this is my message. Uh, how can we frame this positively? It's living in accord with the Creator's design. It's living in harmony with who God made us. It's living in tune with our body. It's respecting our body. So all of this positive language, harmony, in tune, this is what we need to train our parents to use. Parents need to use positive language when they talk to their young people because this is what's going to win over their hearts. You can make good arguments, but we also have to win their hearts. And you do that by showing that the Christian ethic is actually much more positive and appealing than the secular view. This lower view of the body is really um, kind of like fragmenting our understanding of body and, say, personhood. So that differentiation creates this, this dilemma here and has real strong implications for these arguments about abortion and euthanasia, uh, homosexuality, transgenderism, and more. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly, because if you put the mind against the body, you are creating an internal fragmentation. If you say, physically, I'm male, and, and so obviously I am designed to interact with a female, but I'm not going to. You know, I'm going to interact romantically and sexually with a male. Essentially, you're saying what counts is not my body. What counts is only my feelings, my desires. And that is an internal fragmentation, a, a self-alienation. I like to read uh, what the intellectuals are saying on the subject, you know, the academics, because that's what filters down to ordinary people eventually. Yes. And so I read a book by a Princeton uh, University professor on transgenderism. And she was defending transgenderism, and yet she said it involves a disconnect. It involves self-alienation. It involves self-estrangement. She actually said in so many words, your physical body means nothing at all. It tells you nothing about who you are. And I thought, wait a minute, she's, this is a defense? To me, that's a critique of transgenderism. Wow. It's showing that the secular view does involve self-alienation, self-estrangement. What we have to help uh, our own children recognize is the Christian ethic is actually holistic. It helps us to achieve self-integration, inner unity, inner wholeness. Here's another story. Um, the chapter in my book, Love Thy Body, uh, on homosexuality, starts with a story of a young man named Sean, who was exclusively attracted to other men. Um, and what's interesting about him is that he lived in a family that was gay-affirming, and he attended a church that was gay-affirming. He never felt any shame or condemnation for being gay, but he eventually he changed and is now married and has married to a woman, you have to say that these days, and has three children. So what changed? He said, I stopped defining my identity by my sexual feelings and started regarding my physical body as who I was. And he said his goal was not to change his feelings, which rarely works. But he said, my goal was to acknowledge what I already had, which was a male body, as a good gift from God. And eventually my feelings started to follow suit. And that's really the question at the core of this debate. Do we live in a cosmos operating by blind material causes, and therefore my body has no moral message, it says nothing about who I am, or do we live in a cosmos created by a loving creator, which is therefore intrinsically good, and therefore we are meant to take our identity from our body. We are meant to honor and respect our body as a good gift from God. Hmm. Nancy, I wrote down in my notes, so this kind of fragmenting dualism that separates the body and the person, if you get this piece, you can really then understand kind of this dehumanizing worldview piece that's at the center of all of these issues that we're debating. 
uh, it begins to make sense. If you dehumanize and then the only thing that matters is my mind and my feelings and I, I've got a total disconnect, then you can argue, I guess, for these issues. But if you see intelligent design, if you see God as the creator and behind this, there's an integrative whole here, that's what really matters. And that's how we can stand on it as a proactive, positive stance toward women, toward life and more, right? Right. See, the secular ethic, like you said, comes from a low view of the body. And where did that low view of the body come from? It comes from the theory that nature is a product of mindless, purposeless forces, and therefore the body has no intrinsic purpose that we're morally obligated to respect. And the mind is free to use it any way it wants. In fact, what's interesting is there's an outspoken lesbian named Camille Paglia. Uh, On the one hand, she says, nature made us male and female. So she doesn't buy into the idea that gender is a social construction. She says, no, no, no. Nature did make us male and female, that humans are a sexually reproducing species. But then she asks, and these are her actual words, she says, why not defy nature? After all, fate, not God, has given us this flesh. Wow. We have absolute claim to our bodies and may do with them as we see fit. So in other words, if nature and our bodies are products of mindless, purposeless forces, then the body has no purpose. It gives us no moral message. It gives no clue to our identity. We may do with them as we see fit. In the Christian worldview, by contrast, nature exhibits a design, a plan, an order, a purpose. And when we live in harmony with that purpose, we are healthier and happier. Nancy, I want to go to the issue of abortion. Um, I think it's pretty easy to understand a little bit of the debate here uh, between body and this personhood piece. Can you jump into the middle of it and just say, Tim, this is the issue in the abortion debate that you have to understand? Right. Abortion is the issue where we can see most clearly that the secular ethic depends on a fragmentation between the body and the person. In fact, that's the language that secular ethicists use. What most people don't realize is that today, virtually all professional bioethicists agree that life begins at conception. The evidence from science, from DNA and genetics, is just too strong to deny it. But their attitude is summed up in a recent article that was titled, So What If Abortion Ends Life? So what these bioethicists are saying is that being human is not enough to qualify for legal protection. The fetus may be human, but it has to earn the right to life by becoming a person. And a personhood is defined in terms of certain mental abilities, a certain level of self-awareness, cognitive functioning, and so on. But notice what the implication is. As long as the fetus is seen as merely biologically human, it's regarded as just a disposable piece of matter. It can be killed for any reason or no reason. It can be used for research and experiments. It can be tinkered with genetically. It can be picked through for sellable body parts, as Planned Parenthood does, and then tossed out with the other medical waste. In other words, being human is no longer enough for human rights. And this is actually called personhood theory. Of course, it's very dangerous because if rights do not depend simply and solely on being human, then you and I and all of us are at risk. So it it demonstrates the danger of dividing body and person. And a Christian would say, no, you are not only human, but also a person from the beginning. We cannot divide these out. We don't accept this fragmented dualistic, divided concept of the human being, we are intrinsic unity from the beginning. Therein uh, is the big battle, uh, probably legally and everywhere, on personhood, right? Yes, and you see it also in euthanasia. It's really the same argument as abortion, but just in reverse. Personhood theory says if you are mentally disabled, if you lose a certain level of cortical functioning, then you are no longer a person even though you're obviously still human. The most um, high-profile 
example was Terry Schiavo. And a bioethicist argued that uh, Terry Schiavo was not a person, even though, obviously, she was human. So at that point, many bioethicists say, you are only a body. That's a phrase, actually, that they use. You are only a body. You can be unplugged, your treatment withheld, your food and water discontinued, your organs can be harvested. So again, being human is no longer enough to qualify for our human rights. I was once uh, invited to appear on, on an NPR program in San Francisco, and I thought this might be a challenging audience. <laughs> and it turned out it was because I, I was promptly disinvited as soon as they started asking me questions because the first question was on abortion. And I said, the case for abortion and, and euthanasia, too, is exclusive. It says some people don't measure up. They don't make the cut. They don't qualify for the status of personhood. And I said, it's the pro-life view that is inclusive. It says if you're a member of the human race, you're in, you count. That every human is a person. They were a bit flummoxed by that. They'd never heard that argument before. So then I continued, and I said the um, pro-abortion position presumes a fragmented view of the human person because it says that the body and the person can be disconnected and that the body alone has no intrinsic dignity. I said the pro-life view assumes holistic view of the human person that says you cannot disconnect the body, that the body itself shares in the dignity and value of the whole person. And so I was using sort of liberal buzzwords, shows how that Christian view actually fits the highest values of the liberal worldview better than liberalism does. And it actually brings honor and dignity to human life. Nancy, um, Darwinianism, is a lot of this debate anchored back in that whole piece? Oh, absolutely. When we ask, why does the secular view have such a low view of the human body? The human body is part of nature. And so it rests on your understanding of nature. And, of course, the Darwinian view is what has cemented in the modern mind the idea that nature is a product of blind, material, undirected, purposeless forces. What I find interesting, Tim, is that the argument that has proven the most effective with my secular friends is an argument from environmentalism. Hmm. In, in the environmental movement, we have learned that in order to avoid uh, pollution and ecological disasters, we have to respect the structure of nature. When we intervene, we have to work with the natural order, not against it. We may not do as we see fit, to use Camille Paglia's words, when it comes to the environment. And what Christians are saying is that when it comes to moral issues, we cannot just do as we see fit. We need to respect the structure of our bodies. We need to honor our biological makeup as male and female. When we are biologically human, in the cases like abortion and euthanasia, when we are biologically male or female, when it comes to homosexuality and transgenderism, that we respect our biological nature. And we're turning the tables here, you recognize, because most people think that it's Christianity that has a low view of the body. There's a reason we have words like puritanical. Both within the church and outside the church, people tend to think that Christianity is, is, is otherworldly. All that matters is the spiritual realm. The material world has little value in in terms of the Christian view. It's the opposite. And this is what is hard for us to get our minds around, I think. Even when I talk to Christian audiences, they're so surprised. They don't realize that Christianity actually has a much higher view than the secular Darwinian view. Yes. Nancy, this has been fascinating and an enlightening. Uh, We've only uh, scratched the surface. Will you uh, stick around and be with me tomorrow for part two? We'll do a part two on uh, this topic, Love Thy Body. Uh, I'd like to dive in a little deeper. Is that okay with you? That would be great. Thank you. And I hope you'll stay with us tomorrow as we're going to be talking more about gender confusion, the hookup culture, this whole issue of casual sex, what the church can do to help these people, and some political implications of our discussion. Stay with us.
You've been listening to Family Talk and a deep discussion between Dr. Tim Clinton and author Nancy Piercy. Go to drjamesdobson.org to learn how to get your hands on a copy of her book, Love Thy Body. Also on our broadcast page, you can read more about Professor Piercy's other work at Houston Baptist University. That's drjamesdobson.org, and then go to our broadcast page. You'll find all that information there. Tomorrow, Dr. Tim Clinton continues his insightful conversation with author and speaker Nancy Piercy. You won't want to miss the conclusion to their discussion on her new book, Love Thy Body, coming up next time on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. This is James Dobson again. Before we go, I'd like to remind you that Family Talk is a listener-supported program. If you've enjoyed this broadcast, we'd appreciate your helping to keep us on the air. Thank you so much for listening and for being part of this ministry. For more information, go to drjamesdobson.org.